Welcome to the ninth Brad and Roses Award for Radical Publishing. Uh, this is the first time we've had uh, the award online and the first time that's been so late in the year. Normally we have our award early in the year, around about May, sometimes tying in with the London Radical Book Fair. This year we didn't have a London Radical Book Fair for obvious reasons and we kept thinking that we would have a, a live event and eventually we just ran out of time. So this is the award for books published last year, non-fiction, radical, political books. It's the only award of its kind. Um, however, it does have a little sister, a little sibling, the Little Rebels Award for Radical, the Little Rebels Award for Children, um, run by the Letterbox Library, because initially we concentrated on uh, adult books, and of course, uh, children, uh, children are readers too, children are being published really well, and they said, well, how can we fit into the adult award? So we now have two awards. So that's good. Um, so this is the this is the ninth. It's organised by the Alliance of Radical Booksellers. The Alliance of Radical Booksellers, which has been going about ten years, is an organisation of um, different types of radical bookshops, ranging from single person pop up shops through to full time professional staffed uh, bookshops with a number of workers. So. We're all there in, in it together. Um, we fund the award. Uh, initially, the funding was uh, through private donations, then some union donations, and now it's it's published. It's funded by the Alliance of Radical Booksellers. Um, look us up online. So, need to start with some thanks. Thanks to Tom Unterreiner and Jane Watts. Uh, they're both customers of Five Leaves Bookshop. I'm Ross Bradshaw from Five Leaves Bookshop. I can't remember if I said that. And Jane and Tom are customers of ours, and they do the initial reading of all of the submissions that come in, of which there are many. They're all on our website if you want to have a look at what's come in. And actually what's come in and the shortlist over the nine years that we've been running is a very good summation of what is being published in radical book selling um, from commercial presses, from non-commercial presses, big presses, international presses, small presses. So it's it's good to see what's what's out there. The format of the evening is that um, we have Tom and Tom and Jane were the initial shortlisters, and then the the job was passed on to three judges. The three judges, all previous winners of the award, are Helena Earnshaw, Angara, and Angarad Pendran Jones. Uh, they were winners in the fourth year for a book called Here We Stand: Women Changing the World which was published by Hono Press, Welsh Press. Uh, the other judge who I think can't be with us tonight, she was, um, she was in at the practice, but we don't think that she can be here tonight, is uh, Sho Hung Pei. And her book, uh, she was the second winner, a book called Scattered Sand, The Story of Chinese Rural Migrants, um, which is really, really interesting book. So they were the judges. Um, Thanks to them, we'll be hearing from the judges soon. I want to also thank Houseman's Bookshop um, because they, uh, they did a lot of the administration of the, the award. Um, and in fact, they do a lot of the admin for the lines of radical books. I want to thank my colleague, Pippa Hennessy, who is out of screen, but is sitting next to me at the moment, um, uh, organizing the, the, the tech. Um, uh, this video will, um, you're either seeing it live or you're seeing it on our, our YouTube channel or through our, our website. So if it's live, uh, well, I don't know who's the winner. Um, if you're seeing it afterwards, well, you may know who the winner is, but uh, you can still see uh, what happens leading up to the, the check. Oh, there is a check, um, uh, a kind of old fashioned check, which I have in my wallet, which is blank at the moment. And towards the end of the evening, somebody's name will be written and that and it says 500 pounds. Uh, I think traditionally at things like that, you have one of these big checks that the bank gives you. Um, but this is all we can run to, a small check for 500 pounds. But in fact, we won't actually send a check anyway. We'll do backs, but you know, good visually. Um, so the format is that um, each of the shortlisted writers will talk for four minutes about the book, um, a sort of radical, bookselling version of speed dating, really. And then one of the judges will tell us who the winner is and give the reasons for picking that book. But before that, I want to ask Helena 
Elena Earnshaw, one of the judges, to talk about the process, and she'll also read out what the shortlist is for those who didn't pick it up on the screen. Thanks very much, Ross. Um, hello, as Ross said, I'm Helena Earnshaw, one of the three judges for the award, along with Ankarad Penrin Jones, um, who I co edited the 2015 winner, Here We Stand With, and Xiao Hung Pai, who's unfortunately um, not well tonight, um, who won in 2013, as Ross said. The task of reading and deciding a winner was, was both a real pleasure and a challenge for us. And as previous winners, we really felt the weight of responsibility in making our choice. Um, it was a fascinating and hugely impressive shortlist. It covered an incredible range of topics and styles, and it was really inspiring to see just how much writing there is on important radical issues out there. Um, of course, it made it difficult to decide a winner um, because they were all so brilliant in their very different ways. Um, so as Ross said, I will introduce the shortlist now. We've just written a few words of summary about each book um, that I wanted to share with you um, that we felt about them um, before you then hear from the authors themselves. I'll do this in the order in which they'll be speaking to keep it consistent. So um, the first person who'll be speaking is Priyamvada Gopal on her book Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent. We felt that this is an important and deeply researched work. It uniquely fills in the missing pages and the link between independence overseas and workers' movements in Britain. More from Priyamvada shortly. Um, the next author, Disarming Doomsday, um, The Human Impact of Nuclear Weapons Since Hiroshima by Becky Alexis Martin. Um, this is a very valuable work that looks at, looks at and provides a critique of our age of nuclear warfare. It takes us on a journey across the world affected by nuclear weapons and nuclear testing and asks many important questions about that. Third on the shortlist, um, Afropean Notes from Black Europe by Johnny Pitts. Um, this is an extremely readable, richly textured blend of travel, history and politics, and it's an intelligent, perceptive account of communities who don't often get a voice. Next, we have um, The Government of No One, The Theory and Practice of Anarchism by Ruth Kinner, an extremely well-researched book that explores anarchist theories and conceptions and misconceptions and challenges our understanding of them, as well as bringing to life some of the key figures in anarchist movements. Crippled, Austerity and the Demonization of Disabled People by Francis Ryan. Um, this is an important and brilliant work by an activist journalist, which exposes the abuse of disability rights by politicians for many of the UK's 14 million disabled citizens in a direct and at times disturbing narrative. And finally, on the shortlist, before you hear from the authors, Sensible Footwear, A Girl's Guide, A Graphic Guide to Lesbian and Queer History, 1950 to 2020 by Kate Charlesworth. Refreshing and smart, this book beautifully draws out the personal history of the author, as well as the collective struggle of LGBTQ communities in Britain over the last 70 years in a very unique way. So it's a pleasure to have, um, I think, all of the authors apart from Francis here tonight. Um, and that's the shortlist. I think you'll now be hearing from them directly. Thank you. Good, thank you. The first person will be um, Priya Mvada Gopal Priya. Um, who teaches at Cambridge University. I'll repeat the book title, which is Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent, uh, which is a fair self-description of the, the content. Uh, Priya spoke in Nottingham at our Bread and Roses Festival recently um, uh, when the book came out. People are still talking about that particular event. Um, the other recent connection um, I had with her was that some racist or tried to order some racist books from our bookshop and copied in Priya. Um, we declined to engage with them, but uh, it was an interesting, but very short correspondence. Um, but it was in a way nice to link Priya to, to our bookshop, but uh, we don't deal with racists. Anyway, um, Priya Gopal, please talk about your book. You have four minutes. Thank you, Ross. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, my book is really driven by two ideas, uh, maybe three. Uh, one is to note that ideas of freedom um, were 
uh, are often presented as uniquely British. Those of you who uh, saw the clip of, of Boris Johnson yesterday uh, speaking about how freedom was a uniquely British value um, will uh, know what I'm talking about. He was just repeating something that is uh, a, a kind of given uh, in this country, that Britain is uniquely uh, freedom loving. And I wanted to challenge uh, that idea by looking uh, specifically at resistance uh, to the British Empire, the empire which claimed to conquer in uh, order to free. Um, and uh, the second idea uh, that I uh, looked at, and I tie this to the idea of freedom, uh, is that Brit the British Empire was not unchallenged uh, in its heyday. Uh, that through the 18th, 19th, and into the 20th century, we see a tradition of domestic resistance to and criticism of the empire in Britain. The third point uh, was uh, uh, built around something I call reverse tutelage, which is to say that um, it isn't just Britain which influenced the colonies. Um, that is something we hear about quite a lot, but also that the colonies, particularly the resistance to the empire, anti-colonial resistance, impacted criticism of the empire in Britain. Furthermore, very important alliances were formed between those who resisted the empire in the colonies and those who were critical of the empire in Britain. And it is really, uh, in a sense, uh, a kind of counter history of the empire, which looks at the reverse direction of influence from colonies to empire, but also looks at the ways in which dissent radical dissent uh, was the common ground, was the basis uh, on which both British radicals and anti-colonial campaigners in the colonies uh, made, uh, a, a, in a sense, made common cause, created solidarities by doing uh, the difficult work of engaging uh, with each other. So in some sense, it's also a history of anti-colonial solidarity. Um, the format of the book uh, is that I look at uh, five or six incidents uh, across Asia and Africa, which had a particular impact on the British public sphere, but also a particular impact uh, on dissent. And I really divide the book into three sections. One looks at 19th century connections that were made uh, between rebellions in India uh, and Jamaica and Egypt and the ways in which that influenced dissent in Britain in the 19th century. Uh, then I look at political travelers, British travelers who traveled to uh, colonial contexts, um, witnessed uprisings and resistance and learned from it. And in the third and final section, I look at um, uh, campaigners from the colonies who spent time in Britain, who uh, made London and Manchester and other, other places their home, and who campaigned on behalf of the colonies, uh, the cause of the colonies in Britain, and the alliances uh, that they made. So these are really the kind of the broad uh, brush strokes uh, of the book. Um, and I think anything more uh, will get me into too many details. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, second will be Becky Alexis Martin. Uh, her book is Disarming Doomsday, The Human Impact of Nuclear Weapons After Hiroshima, which is published by Pluto Press. Uh, Becky teaches at Manchester Met University. And if you want to see more of her talking after this, uh, you can find a conversation that she did for CND recently online. Um, obviously, the CND link is important to, to the book. Uh, Becky, four minutes is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it is an absolute honour to take part in this event. Um, it's, um, I feel so humbled to be included in such distinguished company, um, to be surrounded by such innovative, radical, feminist, post-colonial and intersectional scholars and writers, um, you know, people that I admire enormously. Um, events like this give me a great deal of hope. It makes me feel happy to see that we can come together to celebrate these new ideas, you know, for peace, equality, social justice, and to explore and, you know, reveal the dark, challenging histories um, that, you know, have manifested in our past. Um, and um, so I wrote a book 
called Disarming Doomsday. And um, it's about nuclear weapons and the harms that they continue to cause across the world. Um, and my book, it contemplates the world through a lens of past, present and future, through space and time. Um, it begins um, in Los Alamos, secret project Y, where the atomic bomb um, was first designed. And then it travels to Almogordo, 16th of July, 1945, for that first test that led to the detonation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for which it's the 75th anniversary this year. So there's this history of nuclear warfare that's been entangled with the places and spaces of scientific research, of weapons testing, of armament and disarmament, of pacifism and proliferation. So in Disarming Doomsday, I consider these places and I look at the inequalities that are created as nuclear weapons are built and designed and detonated. Um, and I consider the legacy of what we call nuclear imperialism. Um, so this impact of places like the US and the UK and France testing nuclear weapons on other people's land. Um, so my work ranges from Carissimus um, to the Marshall Islands and I explore the lasting harm that my testing has um, um, caused to indigenous communities um, and the ways that communities can reclaim their autonomy so I've spent a lot of time working with communities in the Pacific to try and make sure and to share their voice on their terms so you've got quotes in my book that I discussed with the community before including um, and um, so I think that's really important I also study the long-term harm to the um, soldiers who were affected by the test um, you know by the tests around the world um, so I think our nuclear Book, I write that for us to address the horror of nuclear weapons, we must be feminist, we must be post-colonial, we must be pacifist, but we must also be practical. Um, and we know that many of the people who are affected by nuclear weapons are still struggling to recover from the effects. Um, and in the Pacific, for example, they are now facing the urgent threats of climate breakdown and ongoing neo-colonialism um, by places such as China and the USA. So my work has attempted to draw together these communities um, from campaigners for the Ban Treaty, nuclear veterans internationally, apocalyptic gamers, um, and to draw attention to these communities, um, whether they're communities that live alongside nuclear test sites, uranium mines, or you know, toxic nuclear military installations. Um, and um, I think it's really important um, because we need to consider the challenges and fallacies um, of nuclear warfare. Um, so we can begin to abolish these dirty, dated and dangerous nuclear weapons and think about a future free from nuclear war. I hope that Disarming Doomsday offers a small opportunity to take us forward and helps us think about this future, particularly in light of the forthcoming ratification of the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's worth noting that Malta um, ratified this treaty only yesterday, leaving only five more ratifications required before it comes into force. So I wrestle with how geography and geographers continue to shape nuclear war and contemplate how we could perhaps prevent it. Um, and I'd like to thank, actually, like, because I never thought I'd write a book, I'm dyslexic, um, and I'm not from an academic background, I kind of went plunging into a PhD at the age of 27, um, and um, I would have never have written a book without my brilliant colleagues, my brilliant mentors, um, Pluto Press, um, and everybody there from Dave to Danny. Um, and um, finally, I want to offer my heartfelt gratitude to the members of Nuclear Communities World Ride, from Fiji to Rocky Flats, who generously shared their story stories with me. Um, the book is for them, Disarming Doomsday is for them, it's a testimony for them and of their global experience and I hope it brings people a greater understanding of the challenges that these communities face. Thank you. Thank you Becky. I, I was reminded of a pamphlet of many years ago by Lawrence Otter which had the title Serious Politics Begin With The Bomb. That just, anyway, read her book. Um, third is uh, Johnny, Johnny Pitt. His book is Afri African Notes from Black Europe, which is published by Penguin. Um, Johnny is the winner of the Jalak Prize for books by uh, writers of colour. He lives between, when we were in touch, he, lives he was living between uh, Sheffield and France. I'm not actually quite sure where you are at the moment, if indeed either of those places. Um, his book is uh, an on-the-ground documentary of areas where Europeans of African descent 
are juggling their multiple allegiances and forming new identities. Uh, welcome, Johnny, you have four minutes. Thank you, it's a, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. I'll jump straight in uh, to give space for everybody else. Um, uh, I'm currently based in, in Peckham, by the way. <laughs> um, in 1948, the year 1029, uh, and 29 men, women and children disembarked the Empire Windrush in Tilbury Docks uh, 30 days after leaving Jamaica. T.S. Eliot penned a work of non-fiction entitled Notes Towards the Definition of Culture, in which he wrote, what is culture? Culture may be described simply as that which makes life worth living. And it's what justifies other people's and other generations in saying when they contemplate the remains and the influence of an extinct civilization, that it was worthwhile for that civilization, uh, for that civilization to have existed. Eliot encompassed a view that uh, much of Britain is adoptive home and Europe believed to be true at that time, uh, that culture was conjured at the imagined top of society and it was the duty of the upper classes to extol and disseminate uh, the virtues of culture to the masses and that the spread of culture wasn't a two-way process but only top down. And yet Eliot's own definition of culture, that culture is something that makes life worth living, is evidence of a worthwhile people didn't emerge from the so-called top, for me, uh, the landscape that sustained my childhood was constructed in working class spaces, black spaces. By the time I turned 25, though, there were no remains for me left to contemplate. The civilization I'd taken part in already seemed extinct because the landscape of my childhood had already vanished. My first youth club housed in a brutalist estate, the first club I'd ever danced in, my first place of work, the building that housed my lifelong barbers, the market where I have some of my earliest memories of my grandma, the street that housed a local unofficial street carnival, and the building that housed the Shabin where my mum and father met, it had all been vanquished with scant evidence that it had ever existed. I began to realise that my great, great, great grandkids, unless something truly catastrophic happens, will be able to stand on Waterloo Bridge and look at the same St Paul's Cathedral or Houses of Parliament as I can now. Landscapes can hold narratives, suggest identities, preserve cultures. Some cultural landscapes are better preserved than others for future generations. If my own psychic landscape was disappearing, I began to wonder about other histories, both working class and black, and how I might begin to unearth them, document them and commit them to history. I wanted to look for blackness outside the academy and find a way to arrive at black Europe from the street up. Knowledge and history from equally ephemeral landscapes and local knowledges as the one I grew up in. It was through this word Afropean that I found a portal into a kind of pluralism that had sustained me. I was looking for landscapes, I found locals, and in the end it's their stories that form the architecture and culture that is included in my book, preserving, preserved sorry, in a cultural archive for future generations to contemplate. And I, I want to thank the other writers included in this list for, for work that sustains my own and, and the Radical Booksellers and the Bread and Roses Award for ensuring that counter narratives uh, to the dominant ones continue to survive. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Johnny. Um, uh, Helena was just uh, holding, holding up the, the, the book. Um, the next person is uh, Ruth Kinner, uh, Government of No One, The Theory and Practice of Anarchism, which is published by Pelican Books. Ruth teaches at Loughborough University, is on the editorial board of Anarchist Studies. And recently she ran the first of our night schools at uh, Five Leaves Bookshop. And um, uh, we hope that she'll be coming back to, 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 to do so. Um, her latest book, which is not the one that she's speaking about, is um, about great anarchists. Um, mm -hmm. So look out for that in, a radical, in Radical Bookshops, published by Dog Section. But meantime, government of no one, Ruth, four minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, like the others, uh, it's a real thrill to be here um, and to be included on the on the list. Um, I also, before I want to start, I want to thank my brilliant editor at Penguin, uh, Cassiana Ionita, uh, and the rest of the team, but particularly Cassiana. So my book is an account of anarchism that presents anarchy as an alternative social order rather than the rejection of social order. I look at the history of the movement to show how 19th century socialists set out a critique of liberal constitutions 
calling themselves anarchists to distinguish themselves as anti-authoritarians. And I use this history as a springboard to, dis to explore alternative social relationships, concepts of change and approaches to organizing. A central theme of the book is the idea of non-domination. And I discuss this as a unifying principle, a motivational ideal, and as a theoretical concept that anarchists use both to critique non-anarchist systems and also to assess the openness of their own organizations. So anarchy is not like the state, whatever form that takes, because it links stability to permanent adjustment rather than to the permanence of law. I discuss thorny issues like violence, and I try to show that the reputation anarchists have earned for aggression is a fair, unfair and distorting. Anarchists were demonized as brutes and terrorists long before movement activists took up arms. The stereotype of the anarchist as, as a violent terrorist remains a, a potent symbol for conservatives, and it's used to beat all kinds of liberals and socialists, as we've seen in America recently, and it's high time that it was put to bed. The book talks about some of the best known figures in the movement and some of the movement's more obscure adherents, and it includes short biographies of the entire set at the end. I try to show where anarchism shades into other politics by integrating discussion of non-anarchists into the text. I don't accept that anarchism shades into minimal state capitalism or right libertarianism, but one of the organizing principles of the book is that anarchism is, in, is inherently inclusive. There are some notable examples where anarchists have failed to put principle into practice. Nevertheless, anarchists have always been sensitive to the complexity of domination and the ways in which this is felt beyond class exploitation. I'm interested in the overlaps between anarchism and feminism, anarchism and anti-racism and intersectionality. I'm also interested in the relationship between anarchism and anarchy. My argument is that anarchism isn't just for anarchists. It's an approach to politics that is centrally concerned with self-government and the tensions that this necessarily involves when we understand that people have different priorities and perspectives. Emma Goldman described anarchism as a beautiful idea. I agree and taking inspiration from her realism and the disappointment of her youthful expectations, I argue that it's possible to think about anarchizing our institutions and practices in the same way as it's possible to think about liberalizing them. This involves using the concept of non-domination and relying on ourselves, putting aside the well-worn conjunction of freedom and the law. I try to show at the end of the book that the government of no one is still a genuinely empowering ideal. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Freedom Press, incidentally, um, Freedom is the, the main anarchist publisher in Britain. They used the title A Beautiful Idea for their recent history of the, the press. And of course, it's another uh, bookshop and a member of the Alliance of Radical Booksellers as well. The fifth tonight is uh, Frances Ryan with her book, Crippled Austerity and the Demonization of Disabled People. Unfortunately, Frances is unable to be here tonight, so Leo Hollis will be representing her. Uh, Frances writes for The Guardian regularly. I suspect many of the people who'll be watching this will have read her columns. Uh, so Leo is, uh, well, it's the second verso book to be listed tonight, and this is something of your own anniversary year, um, but that's maybe for another discussion another time. Um, uh, please represent uh, Francis tonight. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Ross, and uh, thank you to the uh, Alliance of Radical Booksellers, uh, Five Leaves and Hausman. It's a, it's a great honour to be asked to speak on behalf of Francis, who is unable to give an introduction to her book today. I do hope she's out there somewhere in the discreet Zoom universe and uh, we raise a glass to you and your work. I know that she was thrilled to be shortlisted, especially uh, among such an extraordinary community of writers. Um, I think like many of you, I came across Frances in the pages of The Guardian. It was in her series of articles, The Hard Working Britain, uh, that she charted uh, the arc and the stories of austerity, finding the places and the people uh, whose difficult lives were being made impossible by the Tory government's brazen policies to cut services. For me, it was the passion that shone through, and, it was, and this is what has been bottled almost by the gallon in this book, Crippled. Um, Francis really struggled through the writing of this book, she refused to tell me until afterwards how ill she had been 
and how difficult it was to write. But none of that comes through because she's totally focused on the lives of those who inhabit these pages. Um, people like Jim Bob, who could not heat one room in his flat, or Bessie, who faces poverty as her benefits are cut, as she charts the, the violence of the fit for work tests, as well as the, the particular impacts that austerity has for women and children with disabilities. These are not the stories that you usually find in newspapers, because that would mean that such situations were news, when in fact they're going on day in, day out. Uh, they are why the media can tell us that the most vulnerable in society are in fact skivers and scroungers. And for me, this is why this book is so important. Uh, we put out a new paperback edition recently with an updated afterward that looks at what has changed and uh, sadly what has remained the same since the book was first published last autumn. If I may, I'd like to read just a tiny section. I mean, after all, you're here to listen to Francis rather than me. So here we go. When Boris Johnson was caught by a journalist burying photographic evidence of a sick child in his pocket in the final days of the campaign, there could hardly have been a clearer symbol of what this particular Prime Minister really thought of public services. The reality that this book outlines, a crumbling NHS, vilified social security systems, squeezed wages and growing homelessness, suddenly did not so much seem a story of the present or even the past, but a glaring warning for the future. Barely a month after the Tories were re-elected, the death of Errol Graham, who starved to death after having his disability benefits stopped, dominated the headlines. The 57-year-old had severe social anxiety and struggled to leave the house, but nevertheless had his social security removed when he missed his fit for work assessment. The story encapsulated not only the human cost of the broken benefit systems that crippled warm dog, but the casual cruelty that is caused when the social safety net so many rely on goes wrong. Bailiffs only discovered Graham's emaciated body when they knocked down his door to a victim. When he was found, his Nottingham flat had no gas or electricity. The only food in the kitchen were two tins of fish, four years out of date. He weighed four and a half stone. Meanwhile, the emergence of the coronavirus pandemic further jolted political life as we knew it. The whole of society was impacted by the spread of the virus and efforts to stay safe from the retail sector to the self-employed in an unprecedented lockdown of social activity. But this hit fewer, harder than people with underlying health conditions. And yet, despite all of this, uh, the extraordinary thing is Francis can still find hope. And this is in some ways the true power of the book. By giving dignity to the lives of those she meets and their stories, by her anger and determination that their names are not forgotten, she remains resolute. She has the target in her sights. And this is the last paragraph of the book. And yet out of the ashes can rise more than a flicker of light, improved sick leave, higher wages for care workers, greater empathy for the disabled and ill, a culture of collectivism based on our interdependence, strengthened and newly respected social security, the possibilities for progress in so many ways, endless, not limited by their scale of our own vision. Those of us with egalitarian ideals in Britain are now tasked with some of the greatest challenges we could imagine. And with each challenge comes a chance for change. The dark era in which we find ourselves does not mean only that a vision of hope and ambition is still possible for the left. It is more important than ever. We can achieve it together. What more can I say? That's Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, and thank you, Francis, for that difficult but ultimately inspiring book. Um, the, the last of the six shortly listed people, which by the way includes five women, two people of colour. Um, that, um, that was not deliberate, but um, nonetheless um, pleasing. Uh, the last person is Kate Charlesworth with her book, A Sensible Fo 
football. Try that again. <laughs> Sensible Footwear, A Girl's Guide, A Graphic Guide to Lesbian and Queer History, 1950 to 2000. 1950, I think, is the, the year of Kate's birth. Um, it's published by Myriad Editions. It's the only graphic book on the shortlist, so Kate's presentation will be slightly different to the others because, of course, you need to see the drawings and we'll try to do that. Um, Kate is uh, quite used to um, uh, prize lists because she was awarded Best Gra Graphic Nonfiction by the Broken Frontiers Award. She was long listed for the Manchester based Portico Prize and she was shortlisted for the Comedy Women in Print Prize. So this is, oh, one, two, this is your fourth, I think. Um, <laughs> so you have four minutes to talk and show some images. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you for including me in this fantastic, I mean, stunning shortlist. I'm extremely humbled. Sensible Footwear is an LGBTQ plus history of Britain from 1950 to the present, um, with an emphasis on lesbians. She wears sensible shoes, used to be a euphemism for that one over there's a raging dyke, and for all I know it still is. But when I came out in 1971, I'd heard of Oscar Wilde and Radcliffe Hall, uh, David Hockney was out, and I'd even heard that Dusty Springfield was supposed to be one of them. But I soon realised that our day-to-day -day lives were part of a queer continuum, um, for the most part undocumented, and I worried that younger LGBTQ folk would, wouldn't know their own history. So around the turn of the millennium, I started to think that uh, about making one huge book to contain everybody's stories, LGBT and Q, um, that would have been impossible because it would have been far too heavy to lift. So um, instead, I, I did this. I settled on a historical timeline, collage pictures with, like this appearing every so often. Um, crammed with facts, images and ephemera, so throw nothing away. Uh, you may need it, I certainly did. It's a sort of zeitgeist for the period in the book ahead, and the history I decided would be linked by personal memoir. Um, the book begins in 1950, and so did I. Um, this, uh, uh, that, but the personal memoir became a much larger element in the narrative than I'd initially envisaged. Uh, but then, you know, the, the personal is political, might have been coined for uh, the queer struggle. And uh, I, wanted to in, I wanted to feature individuals, heroes, uh, people like uh, the astonishing Jackie Forster, inimitable woman, for years, virtually the only lesbian who was willing to appear in the media, head above the parapet as an out dyke. I also wanted to celebrate community. And um, coming up, here's gay news. This is our fortnightly newspaper. It was published from the early 70s to the early 80s, and alas, it was successfully prosecuted for blasphemy in 1977 by self styled guardian of public morals, Mary Whitehouse. They were out to get us on so many fronts. A graphic novel is a very large comic, and uh, this combination of words and pictures has a power that words alone can't match. Women have been sidelined and excised from history by the exclusive use of the male, use of the male pronoun. And lesbians were famously invisible on and off the page. So I felt that to have a graphic history uh, covering as much as possible in pictures was uh, quite simply essential. So here are some of them. Here in 1988, the fabulous women who abseiled into the House of Lords in an anti clause 28 demo. And the first grin is the first great uh, anti clause 28 march in Manchester. It was absolutely countrywide. And I wanted the book to look fabulous. I wanted it to be human and I wanted it to be funny. I mean, I didn't want to read a dry history book, so why would anyone else? So, yes, there are jokes. We're here, we're queer, we're not going shopping. We did actually chant that sometimes. And this here is a Greek chorus of 60 somethings. Me, my partner and friends are in real time commenting on the story so far. It's a linking device too. Different styles and features help a visually complex book to read more smoothly. And I hoped in the end it would be a book about all of us, queer and straight. And from the feedback I've had since publication, it seems to have touched many lives, which is wonderful. So, in towards it, here's the Aurora Queerialis. We've come so far in a very short time. 
but there's no time for complacency. Just love and solidarity and pussycats by the sound of it. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you so much. And also to my fabulous partners, publishers, indeed, Myriad Editions and Creative Scotland for supporting the project. Thanks to you all. Thanks, thanks, Kate. Um, um, being 67, uh, a lot of those images <laughs> meant a lot. Uh, and I was on that Man Manchester demonstration, which was uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, with um, And I'm going to dedicate this part, your part of the talk, to my friend Chris Richardson, who's very ill at the moment and has been a, a, one of the founding fathers of uh, LGBT uh, life in Nottingham since he moved up from London from his involvement with the Gay Liberation Front. Um, so um, Chris will see this um, later. Uh, so, um, thank you, all six of you. Um, we want to know who has won. Uh, I don't know. So, over to Helena Earnshaw, who's uh, speaking on behalf of the judges. Who's won? Thank you. I'll try not to drag this out too long. First, though, I just want to say thank you to the Alliance of Radical Booksellers on behalf of the judges for asking us to be the judges and to the shortlist for writing um, such brilliant books that gave us some very inspiring lockdown reading. Um, we're sorry, we can't give each of you a prize, but sadly not. Um, before we started discussing the books on the short list, Ankara Xiaohang and I drew up what we felt were the key, key, sorry, key criteria for a winning title. All of the shortlisted books obviously aim to encourage social change in one form or another, but we felt that the winning title needed to do more than that. Um, it needed to also have depths of research, um, which many of the books already did, it needed to have originality, and the writing should not only be informative and accessible, but should essentially move the reader. Um, and for us, one title really stood out in all these respects. It's a multi-layered lyrical book. At a dark time in politics, it combines gritty accounts of hardship with genuine joy and sense of adventure, which felt very welcome when we were reading it. Original, moving and deeply engaging, it's a hugely impressive achievement and we feel it deserves the widest possible readership. So I'm delighted to announce that the winner of the Bread and Roses Award for Radical Publishing 2020 is Afropean by Johnny Pitts. Congratulations, Johnny. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I, I'm really lost for words. And um, uh, oh, thank you so much. It's, um, it's so inspiring um, to, um, I don't know, be up here with, with, with these writers who have been so politically engaged, especially as somebody who's from a generation uh, born in the 80s, who I think kind of grew up almost apathetic. I think we grew up, we came of age after the, the end of history. Communism had fell. Uh, there was not much to anchor ourselves around. Things like the miners' strike uh, and, and, and the, the war against apartheid were, were not movements that, that engaged us. And by the time that we came of age, neoliberal ca capitalism was kind of the only, uh, the only vision, uh, even, even on the so-called left. Uh, so, so for me, I feel like I've, I've, I've I don't know, um, I, I, I came across so many movements uh, so late on, uh, and it's just, um, I, I really wasn't expecting to, uh, to, 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 to win, so I didn't prepare anything, but I, I suppose what I want to say is that, um, um, you know, bread for all and roses too, um, and I think about this tradition of, uh, in the African-American tradition of, of, of the concrete rose. And, and you can see this in uh, The Rose of Spanish Harlem by uh, Benny King. You can see it in a, a Rose is Still a Rose, a song by Aretha Franklin. You can see it in the poem, A Concrete Rose, which was uh, written by Tupac Shakur. And what this, uh, what this history, what this uh, narrative asks us to do is, is to, to, to look at a rose that might bloom in a place that isn't being nurtured. And, and yeah, it, leaves might not be quite as bright as, as in other places. Its stems might be falling to the side. But we should marvel at the fact that a rose can bloom from a place where no one's asking it to. Um, and, and what I want Afropean to be is, is, is that concrete rose. Um, I remember being at school and, and I remember always being obsessed with words. Um, and, but 
I remember using the word ubiquitous a lot and, uh, and my teacher telling me off for showing off. And so I feel like nobody was asking me ever to, to, to write, to, to become a writer. And, um, and, and so this book really is for all of those people who are from areas like the one I grew up in, which is Firth Park in Sheffield, where, where the full Monty was filmed, but wove out that kind of uh, that multiculturalism that is, is really in the area. And, and I just hope that um, it winning an award like this can, uh, can encourage uh, people from like from the places that I grew up uh, to, to really engage both uh, in, in literature and also politically. Um, so what I want to use this moment to do, I had to think very carefully about, uh, I couldn't say no when, when Penguin offered me the chance to, to get published by them. But what I want this moment to do is really shed light on, on all the work that has gone before me, uh, on, on work from uh, people like Gloria Vecker in the Netherlands, uh, people like Aimé Cesar in France, uh, people like you know um, Audrey Lord and Paul Gilroy. Um, and I want this to be a sort of gateway into their work and entrance uh, into their work and also shine a line on radical booksellers. So, you know, I, what I hope is that every time my book is in the, is in the spotlight, it, um, I'm going to make sure that they put this on, on the book of the next edition if there is another one. And I, I really hope that um, I, can, I can just continue to work with uh, radical booksellers and also authors. I'm, I'm droning on because I'm genuinely uh, shocked. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, I'm over the moon. Thank you. <laughs> my, my partner, my partner, my partner Natasha is. Can, can, can you? Come? My partner Natasha was heavily pregnant with our, uh, who's been doing the, the, the kind of work that uh, doesn't enter uh, the the kind of um, uh, the, the stream of um, isn't isn't rewarded very often. Um, told me right at the last minute you know you should think you you, you know you could win you should think about some kind of uh, some kind of <laughs> some kind of a uh, thank you speech so uh, yeah yeah thank, thank you to Natasha who's just been holding up the fort for me <laughs> what what's what was really funny is you said you said when it was announced you looked shocked and then you said you're lost for words well you weren't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hello, Natasha, from all, all of us as well. Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, well, that's it. Uh, we've got a winner, and of course, you're all winners. <laughs> we're, we're all winners um, because the books are so great. Um, we'll be in touch with Johnny um, very quickly to, 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 to get something that Natasha can help you write, <laughs> just a little um, <laughs> bit that we can put on the press release. Um, uh, t tomorrow. Um, so have a wee think about that overnight. Um, thanks to those uh, who've participated and supported this event and uh, of course many more people are going to see it later on the YouTube and on the, the website. So um, congratulations again to Johnny and that's it for, for Bread and Roses Award for this year. Thanks so much.